May we live up to that, giving all for Christ. Thank God he has given all for us. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Again, if you'll go there with me this morning, and may God help us. We need the Lord, don't we? You know, church is pretty empty without the presence of the Lord. I remind myself as I prayed, though, just whether, whether I feel like I have, excuse me, I don't know how to express it the best, but I feel like I'm feeling that presence is irrelevant to the fact that he's promised to be in our midst. Don't let the facts of what God has said confuse you about what he's promised to do. Uh, we come to church and we have, we have, maybe we think we have certain needs about experiencing this, that, or the other. What we need is the presence of Christ. Now, thank God he lives on the inside of us in the person of the Holy Spirit. But he's enough, and that's, that's what he, uh, he has for us today. And I want us to rest in that. But may God have his way. May God have his way. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need his help. And I'm praying for it even now as I begin to speak. And uh, Colossians chapter 2, I hope you're there. It's good to have folks with us. I see uh, that we've got Brandon and Amber with us. But, but I want to know, is Elena here? That's who we're looking for. She's in the nursery. That's good. And she's doing well. Last doctor's report was doing better and better, and things are going well. Amen. Glad for that. And I'm glad you're here, by the way, but we're glad you brought Elena with you. That's, that was a good move on your part. And also good to see uh, Pastor Kelly and his wife here, Ms. Tiffany's mom and dad, and from down in Jacksonville, Florida, and we're glad they're visiting today. And I think I told him the last time I saw him, if this sermon falls apart, I'll just tag him in, and he can come finish it off here in just a little while. But we're, we're honored to have you visiting with us today. And I know you're here because Audrey is here. Amen. And she had that third birthday party, and we're glad for that. She was engaged in choir practice with us just a little while ago, and she was doing a great job. So we're, we're honored to have folks with us and folks joining us online. Let's look to the Word of God together. Verse 1 of, of Colossians chapter 2, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ." These blessed words here that we have that we, we began dwelling on uh, last week and meditating on from verse 9. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then these, these powerful words, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And we praise God what Jesus Christ has done. God willing, in the meeting tonight, I have some special things planned, special guests I'll talk about a little bit later, but, but I'll be dealing with what is mentioned there in verse 13 and 14, how our sins are blotted out. I know. And they were nailed to his cross. Amen. Thank God for that. But this hour, as we consider the fact that we are complete in Christ, and uh, we have almost a mini-series in the middle of this series on the book of Colossians, as we consider what it means to be complete in him. Complete in him. I'm glad to know that I can be complete in Christ for the, the work that Christ's given me to do. I need the completion that comes from him for what he's called me to do as a believer, as a follower, as a member of the family of God. I need him in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory to complete me. There's so much that I think I want to see done in this life and even so much I want to see done for the cause of Christ in my life and in the life of this church and I realize how inadequate I, that I am. Even my, my goals can be man-made goals, and I have to be careful about what I said and what I expect and what I want to experience. I just know I need the completeness of Jesus Christ. And, and God help me. I, I, I don't want to be desperate in the sense that I'm, 
I have, have no access to all the riches of Christ, but I want to be desperate and more about Jesus and more of his love and more of his way for my life that I can be complete in him. And by the way, we know, we know, church, we know, we've lived long enough to know that no one understands like Jesus and nothing satisfies like the Lord. Amen? No one, nothing. We've had some level of accomplishment We've gotten that job. We've gotten that promotion. We've married that girl or that man. God's given us these children or God's given us that house. God has done all these things. And yet without him, we know all that means nothing. It means little to nothing in this life. He, we are only complete in him. We're only complete in him. And we need that completeness. We need it. Spurgeon said this. I, I share this quote with you as I began. I shared it as I ended on last Lord's Day. We think that, that, that he, Spurgeon says this. He says that in the journey to heaven, uh, he, he that is in the journey to heaven must be provided for all weathers. For though it be sunshine when he first sets forth, a storm will overtake him before he cometh to his journey's end. He goes on to say, have faith in Christ and you're ready for anything, thankful for everything, afraid of nothing because you are complete in him. If we're in Christ, and if in Christ we said on last Lord's Day, if truly if we find, what it said in verse 3, all wisdom and knowledge and the fullness of God, we can certainly find ourselves complete in Him. We ought not accept any of the substitutes that I mentioned or any other desire that comes to our mind that we feel like we're thirsting after or longing after because to find those things, to accomplish those things is only find disappointment in life if they are accomplished without the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're complete in Him. These verses are so powerful. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. That means we have a new position. We have a new relationship as believers to enjoy in that of being complete in Christ. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. As I said earlier, we're not perfected, but we are completed. Someday there will be a perfection in my life. I'll be completely redeemed from the power and the presence of sin. And we all look forward to that. And we look forward to what God will do. But I'm glad in the midst I am completed because of the presence of the comforter in my life. And it says here that in verse 10 that, that he is the head of all principality and power. We'll talk a little bit more about that God willing this evening if the Lord will allow. But Christ's authority and power, I want you to know, make him able to complete us. Make him able to complete us. And the fullness of Christ, again, as we say, as we say in this chapter, is, 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 is found in this spiritual circumcision in verse 11. But not only there, as we talked about last Sunday, as this reproach of Egypt rolled away, and we're actually made complete by having that rolled away. But we also find ourselves, secondly, as we think about this morning, complete by being buried with him. Interesting, as I think about being completed, I think about being added to and when the Lord is teaching us here through the pen of the Apostle Paul to these Colossian believers, again, he had a great burden for them, even though he had not seen them. He had a great burden for them. I admire that and pray for that in my own life. But he, he helps us understand that being, God's economy is so much different than ours. We think I'm going to be completed because Christ is going to fill up my deficiencies. But he begins by telling me I'm completed by this being rolled away, and I'm completed by being buried. That doesn't sound like addition. That sounds like subtraction to me. But only the Lord could complete me through the process of what we call subtraction. Is it still true that his ways are not our ways? And it must be true that his ways are definitely higher than our ways. We find that truth, don't we? So not only do we find the fullness of Christ in the circumcision made without hands, we find it in being buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Now, I speak of the spiritual baptism that we enter into when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for the, the ordinance of baptism. We'll talk more about that as God gives liberty in this message. But the, don't, don't confuse the ordinance with the spiritual baptism, meaning that we are baptized into the family of God when we, become, when we come to Christ and repent of our sins. And this physical baptism, this symbol, this ordinance that God's given us is, a, is, a, is an indicator of what God's done in our spirit and what God has done and bring us into his family. Verse 12, again, it just helps us to understand more about the completion. Through spiritual baptism of death and resurrection of the dead, we can have fellowship with God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, these, par these, these human paradoxes are where the Lord teaches us so much. He says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless what? I live. <laughs> so the way to live is to die. 
The way to be complete is to have a spiritual circumcision and to be buried with him. But I'm crucified with Christ, he said in the book of Galatians. Paul wrote there, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the, Christ, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, prior to us coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we had a life that was filled with sin. I like to rehearse often with you when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ as a young boy. And I had not had enough uh, experience in life to pull off some of the, the, the sin that I may have had the privilege to pull off in my adult years. As a young boy, I had not, I had not murdered anyone. Excuse me. I had not robbed a bank. I could hardly know how to even tie my shoes at that point successfully. I could cause some trouble. I do remember doing a few foolish things. I almost caught the entire, entire yard on fire one time. We lived in that place in Greer, the place, the same house I was saved in. I've told you about for years, is, is that house was surrounded by trees and leaves. And uh, so much so, you really didn't have to, har hardly have to mow the grass. I praise the Lord for that. Uh, but it was just like a little, little area of trees around there. I could ride my go-kart go through a little path I had there. I was about the most grass mowing I did was knocking down the grass with my go-kart. That was a blessing. But I can remember doing some crazy things out there, exploring out there and all of it. But what was I? I was a boy that needed the Lord. There was a point in my life then where I had not necessarily, I couldn't look to some of the great, what we, what we rank are some of the great sins of the world. By, by the way, all sin is against God. That's what makes it so egregious. It's not what it is, but it's against who we're sinning. Does that, does that resonate? The reason sin is so awful, whether we, whether we, whether we uh, categorize it as great or small, is because it's a, who's it's against, who it is against. Yep. It's against the one that loves us with an everlasting love. But as a young boy, I, my life was filled with sin. You know, I came to a point where I recognized I was under the condemnation of God. I realized that I was born in sin, and that began to plague me and to weigh on me. Like I cannot even explain to you, and even though that was some 39 years ago or, or more, I remember vividly the weight of sin in my life filled with sin. And I thank God when I came to Christ by faith through repentance, I know what it was like before and after. Before I was in turmoil, before I could not rest, before I thought about the flames of hell constantly, especially as I laid down in the quiet hours of the evening to try to go to sleep. That's what life was like. It was miserable. I was miserable, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm glad God's given me that memory. I don't want to forget that. But also remember what it was like when I repented. When Dad and I got up off that bed after he'd shown me some scriptures. And you know what I remember there? Complete cleansing and peace. I, my life was filled with sin. But thank God when I came to Christ, it had already been appropriated for me because Christ died on the cross some 2,000 years before and was buried and rose again. But prior to that salvation, my life was filled to sin. But that, that old nature that night, it was vanquished because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It was blotted out as we read a few moments ago. It's, it's cast as far as the east is from the west. Thank God never to be held against me again. I'm forgiven and I'm on the way to heaven. I have an eternal life. I thank God for it. Prior to my salvation, my life was filled with sin. Thank God, because of Christ's death, that has been wiped out, and he's now enabled me to live a life that is void from the, power, the, the control of sin in my life. Thank God, uh, I, I can hopefully, as I work and with the power of the Spirit in my life, I'm not going to become sinless, but I can sin less and less and please God more and more. And by the way, I'll be a happier camper when I'm doing that. Amen. <laughs> Maybe I should say a happier Christian when I'm doing that. Nothing makes, your life, makes my life worse as a Christian than when I am partaking in sin. Oh, and it happens, doesn't it? It happens. Again, you might rank that here. You say, well, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this little thing, this little thing. But anything we classify as sin, it's against our Lord. Yeah. And it puts us in, an, in a miserable position. Thank God 1 John 1, 9 is in the book that I can confess my sins as a believer. And he is faithful and just to forgive all those sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and, and to recalibrate my relationship with the Lord. I'm glad he does that. But prior to my salvation, I was filled with sin. And thank God, Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection just absolutely obliterated that sin. And as a believer now, I'm baptized into Christ through his death. And through his death, I'm freed from the law. I'm free from the necessity to actually serve sin and not to be a slave to sin. 
And we picture all that spiritual activity through the holy ordinance of baptism. It's, it, it takes the most exalted place, especially in a Baptist church. Amen? We, have, we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Would you go with me to what Matthew has to say about the Lord's baptism? Matthew chapter 3 this morning. I encourage everyone that knows the Lord to follow the Lord in believer's baptism because of what's given to us here in the Gospels, the record of the Lord Jesus Christ, His baptism. Quite an amazing thing. And by the way, Acts 2.41 is in the Bible. The Bible's in Aaron. It's infallible, and it has it right. Then they that believed were, gl were gladly believed were baptized. Then they that, were gla that gladly believed were baptized, and they were added unto the church that same day. Thousands there, the Bible says. And so belief must precede baptism. And it's, it's important that we identify with, with the Lord properly because of the picture of baptism that it gives, the picture of baptism gives us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not something to be toyed with. But in Matthew chapter 3, if you're there, say amen. amen. And let's, let's go back up to verse 13. I was going to read at verse 15, but at verse 13, this was a big day in John's life. Big day in John's life. Look here, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. How would you like to have been John? Yeah. This is what John did. He said, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? That sounds like what we would say. Uh, I told our, our crowd just a little earlier this morning, I think, I don't even know what I said to the Lord. I might have just turned tail and ran. Like, I can't, I'm not worthy to baptize the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not worthy. And you know, often, this is another sermon altogether, and God's given me this thought earlier this morning. But you know, often God gives us things to do that we think are impossible, but if God tells us to do it, we ought to obey Him. Yeah. We ought to obey Him, and this is a great application and a great example of that in John's life. And sometimes uh, we, we're just overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed. I, I, I'm thinking of last late last night or in the evening hours last night as I was trying to finish up a few things, looking over this message. I have my laptop out is in my lap, but my laptop, we're waiting on a battery to come in for the laptop. So the laptop always needs to be near an electrical receptacle. I have to have it plugged in. Basically, I have a mobile desktop. Thank God it's light. And I just carry it with me, plug it in, and I'm waiting on Amazon to come through to help us out. So I have to keep that laptop plugged in. And if it happens to un be unplugged, I have, I have just moments before it just shuts down and then moments before all my research, all my theorizing, all my putting together of my thoughts and my sermon disappear. And if it's not saved exactly the last, the last thing I did, who knows what will happen to me. Well, last night as I'm sitting there trying to get all that together, working out all these details, aware of the problem that I have, but trying to push through, my, my, my son Carson comes and jumps right in my lap. Praise the Lord. Which gets your attention, by the way. He's a growing boy. He's a growing boy. That got my attention. But sure enough, as soon as he got in my lap, he knocked the cord out of my laptop. And we both went frantic. I was ah! Carson, 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 get it, go, go, go. And, you know, it took us longer to plug it back in because we got so excited and uh, so worried about all that. And I got it plugged back in. I said, boy, you better be glad I didn't lose any of that sermon right there. I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry. Well, we were just goofing off with each other. And I said, if I'd have lost that sermon, you'd be preaching tomorrow, boy. You'd be doing the preaching tomorrow. Oh, no, Daddy, I can't do that. I said, that's what I would do. I'd walk right up to the pulpit like I would say. I'd introduce somebody to sing. you pray for them as they sing. And right after they sing, Carson's going to come and preach the Bible for us today. No, Daddy, no, no, no. I can't do that. I can't do that. I think that's how John felt that day when the Lord said, you're going to baptize me. That's how John felt that day. It was a pretty powerful thing. It was a powerful symbol to all of us as believers it speaks so much to the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? God help me. God help me in all of that. But he says here, uh, baptize me. And, and, and John said, I can't do all that. But the Lord was baptized. And one, one commentator said this is one of these high holy times in the Bible where you see God the Father, God the Spirit, and God, God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all present and all spoken of here in just a few, few verses. I don't think it's the only example in God's Word. You know, I really believe, and, and you, could, you could debate with me about it. Maybe we'll do that another time, not right now. But when you get back there in verse Genesis chapter 1, and, the, and we, we hear there that man is getting ready to be made in the days of creation, so they say, let us make man in our image. I personally believe we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit there in creative activity doing, doing that work. Yeah. 
So as we see mention of the Father, the Son, uh, the, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit here is not the only time, but it does depict a high, holy time. When someone said this, uh, a preacher no doubt said this, that it's this, our Savior attended, the Holy Spirit descended, and the Father in heaven commended. And they were all there. And it's something very important. This physical activity is a beautiful picture of what happens to us spiritually as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are to be complete in him. If we're to be complete in him, baptism is a beautiful picture of us being buried, but we're buried with someone else, and it happens by immersion. I want, don't you understand these pictures are powerful in God's word, very powerful in God's word. In Romans chapter 6, would you go there with me, please, as we think again about this spiritual activity of our being baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ and baptized into his body. It, again, happens by immersion. This morning, if I were to have a, a container on, the, on my right, on your left, of, of liquid dye and a piece of white cloth on this, this side here. If I wanted to dye that cloth, I wouldn't just, I, it depends on what you want to take, what you want to happen, but if I want it fully dyed, I would dip it, I would plunge it, I would completely immerse that cloth into that liquid dye in order to have it turn out the color I want it to be. That same word is what's expressed here in God's word for this picture of baptism. And it's a picture of what Christ is doing for us, the thoroughness of it, the completeness of it. But in Romans chapter 6, Paul, again, writing this wonderful treatise here that has so many helpful truths all the way through the book. But in verse 3 of chapter 6, he says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. There's a completion in this immersion, and there's a resurrection that brings us to a new life. Look in verse 6, that knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So as we studied circumcision on the last Lord's Day, it was a picture of what God does. We studied baptism. It's a picture of what God does. And these types and these pictures and patterns, God gives them in order to instruct us in the truth of what he is doing in this world. And often, you know, we, we, get, we get pretty intelligent. We become Bible scholars, and I'm all for studying the Bible. I'm all for making effort at that. I'm all for understanding exactly what God wants us to do and not just having a surface effort at it. But sometimes in our thirst and our lust, for something that no one else has seen or no one understands or sometimes in our thirst and our lust to justify something that we would rather do, we somehow look and misinterpret God's word for own purposes, for convenience sake or whatever the case may be. I read this story. I'll share it with you. In regard to baptism, there was an old country preacher. Didn't, some folks said he didn't have a, a lot of education, but he did, uh, didn't have a lot of book sense, but he had a whole lot of common sense, and he certainly knew his Bible. Certainly knew his Bible. He went out to hear another local pastor preach. And uh, the fellow preached that night, was preaching on baptism, what it meant to go into the water. And he thought the idea of going into was something like going in the neighborhood of, going nearby, not necessarily down into it, but close by. That was his explanation, trying to explain and, uh, his deeper understanding of the Greek language than anyone else has ever had, you know, in the history of preaching and teaching the Bible. Basically saying that you can be on the edge of it, you can be close to it, you can be in the neighborhood of it. And that's what he preached that night. Old country preacher thought that was interesting, didn't quite line up with his theology and his approach. But the next day he happened to see that same local pastor walking in front of a saloon. And he went on down the street, and, and the, the, the country preacher did, and, and went to the leading deacon in that pastor church and said, he said what? He said, you know what, I just saw your pastor in the saloon. How about that? Well, that deacon made a beeline to his pastor and said, you know what? That old country preacher just came and told me that he saw you in a saloon. What's, what's going on, pastor? And that preacher got the deacon, and they went up to find that old country preacher, and they said, what do you mean slandering my name and ruining my reputation? I wasn't in that saloon. I was just near it. I was just passing by. And the old country preacher said, well, I was just trying to be true to your exposition and your high level of interpretation. You know, last night you said that into meant nearby or close to or at or passing by. I just thought it meant the same thing today when you were passing by that saloon. <laughs> Be careful, <laughs> right? Believer's baptism is an example of what, what Christ did. It's an example of what he is doing in our life through a spiritual work. It's a beautiful and simple thing, but it has tremendous and meaning, meaningful significance in our life. Listen, to be complete in Christ, we're to be buried with him in his baptism. Buried with him in his baptism. And thank God it doesn't end there. Secondly, you see it, it says we're to be risen with him. 
You can't have a resurrection unless you have a burial. You can't have a resurrection, excuse me, unless you have a death. And you can't be complete unless you die. But thank God the completion comes in the resurrection. The second part of the identification with Christ is with Christ's resurrection. Back in Romans 6, we won't go back there. I, I leaped over that, I left over that verse a moment ago, but it says this, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the like, be in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank God we understand what's happening. We're buried with the Lord in the likeness of his death. We're raised with the Lord in the likeness of his resurrection. The resurrection confirmed that God accepted Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross. He did. Someone has said to me once that, that, the, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave was like God's receipt for Christ's payment on the cross. It's like you and I would go into a place of business and purchase something and swipe a card or pay cash. Well, it's harder to do that today, I guess, or no, don't try to give them any coins. Don't do that. But we pay for that thing in full, and we, they will give us back. Would you like the receipt, sir? And that receipt is a record of that transaction. And I want you to know the record of God's accepting that transaction on the cross is that Jesus got up from the grave, that he's alive forevermore. When Christ's body lay in that borrowed tomb, thank God it was a borrowed tomb. I love to express it that way. It wasn't needed very long. He just needed to borrow it for a little while to get our redemption done, to get the work of God done, to fulfill the prophecy that God had, had etched in the pages of his holy word all these hundreds of years before. While God, Christ's precious body lay in that borrowed tomb, that it would seem that the punishment process for our sins was still in, in process. But thank God when he arose, the process we knew was complete. All those that saw the tomb empty, all those that would see the risen Christ would say, paid in full, the job is done. And thank God because of that, the believer need not to fear death because it no longer has a hold over us. That's the completeness that we find in Jesus Christ as we're buried with him. Thank God we can be risen with him and we will rise because he rose bodily from that grave. Thank God we too shall rise Amen. in that resurrection morning when the trump of God shall sound. We shall rise. Hallelujah. We shall rise. And we'll be together with them and with God forevermore. So Christ destroyed the power of death, and death is mighty powerful, isn't it? Yeah. So powerful. Daunting. I hear people say, God help me as I've considered these thoughts, I hear people say, I'm not afraid to die, and I, I don't know that I could echo that truthfully. I'm not excited about the process at all. I mentioned our... I mentioned our friend lately, Brother Doug Allen, went to be with the Lord. On Christmas Day of this past year, he received an, an, an a diagnosis of an inoperable cancerous tumor on his pancreas. Not much of a Christmas gift, is it? I went over to see him that morning. We, I couldn't believe it. I, I hope I said, did you, did you, are you sure they're right about this? I mean, this seems so sudden. Pastor, that's what they're telling me. That God will give me grace. God will give me grace. God will be with me. God will help me. I know what the Lord's going to do. These are words that Doug would echo over the next several months. So I'd have the chances, the opportunities to visit with him, not as often as I would like because of this dreaded COVID-19. But he always spoke in faith about knowing what the outcome was. But he was, I want, to, I want you to understand this. I want to say this respectfully, but Brother Doug didn't enjoy the process. His dear, precious wife wasn't enjoying the process. Royce and Joyce are with us in the meeting this morning. We, we love you all. I've been praying for all of you. The process is painful. And I, 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 I can say I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the outcome of my death, but I'm not excited about the process. I think, I think it would be wise for us as Christians, especially as we think about our children coming along and those who are coming along behind us, to not to speak uh, in an incomplete way about not fearing death. I don't, I don't think interest, interested in, excuse me if you don't mind me saying it, in some sort of accident, in some sort of catastrophic thing, in some sort of terrible diagnosis and dying in some miserable way. And I'm sorry to say because sin is in this world and this world is broken, there's, there's a misery in death that, that, that we, we want to escape. I'm glad even though I may not be excited about the process and I may literally at times have some fear of the process. I'm glad I don't have to worry about the product. I know that Jesus Christ rose up from the grave. By the way, his, his life ended, his physical life ended in the most miserable way you can imagine. Miserable. 
miserable torture. And by the way, Christ, best we can tell, that, that was a great concern to him as he went to the cross, as he prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I just think this, as I read this and thought about this, and I just felt God laid me to share this, this point with you, I, I think it's foolish for us to say, I'm not afraid of death. I, don't, I think it'd be wiser to say, I'm not excited about the process, but I'm, I'm very excited about the outcome. I'm confident in the outcome because of who Christ is, because he got up from the grave. Because I want you to understand, death may look like it has power, but the actual end of our physical life is victory. See, when Christ, as Christ hung his head and, and his body expired on that cross, as he gave up the ghost, excuse me, let me say it properly. No man took his life. No man took his life. He laid it down willingly. As he gave, gave it, it looked like defeat, but it was actually the means of victory. Yeah. Amen. It looked like it was over, but that new life had just begun. And my friend, when death knocks at our door, whatever the case may be, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wicked thief. Something that we desire to avoid at all costs and in any way, no matter whether we believe in Christ or not, that we, don't, we don't invite that. I realize life can get difficult. And there, Excuse me, I, I, I'd like to respectfully say there are things in this life that are worse than death. I acknowledge that. Pain and suffering. But when we say that death has been defeated, I want you to know death doesn't, still is not going down without a fight. Yeah. It's trying to win every battle with every human being. But it doesn't win. Because Christ got up, my friend, simply put, we too shall get up. Because Christ rose bodily, we too shall rise bodily. Thank God for that. Christ destroyed death. God accepted his payment. And that payment is good for you and me if we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we see here a beautiful picture as we refer back to what's going on in Colossians. And we refer to back to Col in, in Romans chapter 6. A beautiful picture of the gospel. This death, burial, and resurrection in the physical baptism that happens in the spiritual world as well. I thank God we also see, referring back to Romans chapter 6, that we can be dead to this world and dead to the, to the absolute slavery that we find in sin. Sin is a terrible taskmaster, isn't it? Can't you say amen to that? I'm right there with the Apostle Paul. I, the things I know I'm not supposed to do, I do them. And the things I'm, I'm supposed to do, I don't do them. And it is a struggle. Thank God we'll be delivered from that. But in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, Paul wrote this, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed and that, hence, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For in that he died, now in verse 10, he died once unto, unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Again, the picture of his death, burial, and resurrection. There's a death in that burial. There's a death uh, and, and there's a resurrection picturing the gospel. But there's also a death to the sin in our life. And th thank God there's also a resurrection of what we can expect in eternity. Thank God for it. Come on, being complete in him. We're buried with him in baptism to be complete in him. We're risen with him in the likeness, uh, newness of life to be uh, complete in him. And all of it takes place how? How does it take place? How does it take place? It says here, and we see here in this verse here, back in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, you look there with me for just a few more moments. God being our helper. You are risen with him, what? Through faith of the operation of God. That's such an interesting phrase to me in God's word. There's more to be said about it than I will say in these next few moments as we close out our time together. Buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Class, you tell me, is the tomb empty? Is the garden tomb empty? The answer is yes. I mean, I'm going to the answer is yes. What's the answer, class? Yes. Good, I'm glad I could help you. I try not to cheat in church, but I just cheated and gave you the answer. Cheated and gave you the answer. It's empty. You know, our choir's been rehearsing uh, this song that we're, we're trying to get ready to sing. If you knew him like I know him. But at the beginning of that song, begins with that solo, I walk by the tomb of Buddha. I walk by the tomb of Muhammad. Bones there, grave clothes there. I walk by the tomb of Jesus and it's, thank God it's empty. Amen. Thank God it's empty. But we identify be, with him being buried in his baptism and we are risen with him through faith in the operation of God. Faith that the fact that the tomb is empty means that he is alive. Yeah. 
By the way, an empty tomb is not, is not enough of a testimony. Excuse me. Was there great concern about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ being moved, being hidden? Was that a great concern in his day? Yes, there were Roman guards posted at that tomb. They were very aware of some of his prophecies, and that they were, they were trying to make sure that nobody took his body anywhere else. But those Roman soldiers couldn't prevent the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that empty tomb, just the fact that it's empty doesn't mean that, that he got up and was alive. It requires faith in the operation of God. So where are we going to get this faith? Church, I'm asking you, where is that faith coming from for you to believe that Jesus, that the tomb's not just empty, but that Jesus actually rose bodily? Where's that faith coming from? You want me to give you the answer? Do I have to whisper it to you again? It comes from Romans 10, 17. Turn there. You probably have it marked in your Bible. I'm glad this Christian life's not too difficult to understand. We need the Holy Spirit's help to do what we know. So where's the faith coming from to believe that, that because the tomb is empty, he's actually alive? Where's that faith coming from? We've rehearsed these truths together before, but look at it with me there. Can we all read it out loud together, class? Could we do that, church, whatever, whatever we call ourselves here today? Are you agree, agreeable to that? If you are, say amen. Good, I'll do anything for an amen here. I'm working hard to get you to say amen. We're going to read that together. Let's try. Romans 10, 17. Ready? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you tell me, church, where's your faith coming from? Are you going to have to work it up? Are you going to have to pray? You're going to have to pray for it necessarily. I think you should pray for it. But where's faith coming from? It's coming from God. And so faith comes by hearing. That's more than just these ears, by the way. These ears get dull, right? These ears get dull. Physically, they get dull. Especially when you fellows are supposed to be listening to your wives. They get really dull. Amen. All right? They get dull. I tell you what, they get spiritually, our ears get spiritually get dull too, don't they? We're not careful. As believers. So faith comes by hearing. We're talking in the spiritual realm here and hearing by the word of God. And so let me ask you this, my friends. If you need more faith, you should have, you should have what? You should have more what? More Bible. More Bible should equal more faith. More of the word of God. By the way, we've got to be willing to hear it. We've got to be willing. If any man will do my will, he, he shall know of the doctrine, right? John 7, 17. I can't just come to God's word with, 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 my, with my governors on and say, well, I can go this far, but no further. That tells me I'm not, I'm not going to be able to hear and I'm not going to have much faith. If I come to God's word with an open slate, a blank heart, a willingness to obey God, he's going to reveal himself to me. And I want you to know the fact, excuse me, if you don't mind me to say it this way, the fact that the tomb is empty is not enough. You must have faith to believe in the operation of God that took place on the cross, the process of the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and what God effected through the person of Jesus Christ, and that he rose up from the grave. And in order to believe that, we need faith, and that faith is only going to come from God and from his word. It may be a traditional truth that has been expressed to you since you were a child. And maybe that helps you to believe it. But true spiritual belief means we must allow the faith that God gives us in our heart to take over and to give us the faith to believe that truth, by the way. By the way, God helped us in a wonderful way. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. If you'll go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We need this faith. It can't, I appreciate the fact of the empty tomb, and I'm not demeaning that. God, God being my helper, help me to express this in the correct way. But I'm not demeaning that, but we need faith, because without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. We need this faith. Faith is going to come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We need faith in the operation of God and the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We absolutely do, and this faith comes from God, and we put the faith that he gives us into the effective working of God that raised up Jesus from the dead. The faith, this faith allows us as believers to be risen with Christ. We must have faith to be buried with him, faith to be risen with him, and thereby we are complete in him. You know, but even so, God has given us a lot of help. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We love this passage because it so clearly identifies the gospel. 
in verses 1 and verses 2 and verses 3, verses 4. But then in verse 5, you'll look there with me, please. Look back at verse 4 for just a little bit of context. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, or seen of Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain until this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, Paul writes, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. We need faith in the operation of God that the process for the forgiveness of sins was enacted for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and that he has definitely risen again, that we too shall rise. But God is helping us, that God gives us substance to our faith by giving this testimony. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe the word of God is inerrant and infallible, that it's true on everything that it speaks on? If you do, say amen. amen. Then the Bible tells us that people saw the resurrected Christ. Yep. They absolutely laid their eyes on him. And it wasn't just single sightings. It wasn't just someone who had pizza for supper that night, and then they had some strange things happen to them in their dream life, and they thought they saw Jesus. By the way, I would not, I would not say that of Cephas or any of the folks that are gathered in this chapter here, James and Paul, even though they were single sightings, single encounters. But there was an event where Christ was seen of 500 people at one time. 500 people at one time. God's helping even with the substance of our faith. This is what he does. We need faith in the operation of God. And then God's word reminds us that Christ was actually seen in his resurrected body. And if we say we believe the word of God, then we can have faith in what God was doing. And it's just that simple. May God give us the faith to believe in the operation of God. If we're going to be complete in him, buried, risen with faith in the God's operation. And that needs to be the case, right? Someone said long ago, been repeated over and over. It's bumper sticker material. God said it, and I believe it. Or God settles it. God said it, that settles it, and I believe it. Lord, to keep it that simple in our life, to identify with the Lord and allow him to complete us. There were two sisters. I read, read this little story I'll share with you. But two sisters were playing on a hillside when they noticed that the sun was soon to be gone. Night was coming. And one of the little girls remarked, look, the sun has almost gone down just a little bit. A little bit ago, it was much higher up in the sky, over the trees, right over there. And the girl's sister, however, responded, well, the sun didn't really move. You know, Daddy told us that the earth is the one that moves, not the sun. And to this, the first sister replied, the sun did too move, not the earth. I've been standing here the whole time, and the earth was perfectly still, and I watched the sun go down. I saw it with my own eyes. I know what I see. Of course, the other sister responded, well, I believe what Daddy said, even if it doesn't look that way. I'm just going to believe what Daddy said, even if it doesn't look that way. And that's the great divide <laughs> amongst all human beings. We need faith in the operation of God to believe uh, what he's doing. By the way, there's some dark hours on the cross. We come to dark hours in our life. We're completing God by, by believing him, taking the faith he gives us to believe in his operation and his work. You know, the Bible teaches that when we're baptized, it's symbolic of our death, our burial, and resurrection in Christ. The baptism doesn't cause any of these things. It declares what happens, the physical baptism. You know, we've got the baptismal full today. We anticipate baptism, baptizing very soon. I highly recommend it if you haven't been baptized after your salvation. But I want you to know there's no saving. There's no saving effort in that water. It's not salvific. It doesn't affect our salvation, but it does signify what God does in an eternal way and bring us into His family, and it completes us. It comes because of the faith that God gives us, and may God give us the faith to believe that He is, He has done, and He is doing. What he promises is in bringing, bringing us from eternal death to eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God we can be buried with him and risen with him. D.L. Moody said this. He said, someday you'll read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher, that is all, out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. I was born of the flesh in 1837, he says. I was born of the spirit in 1856. That which is born of the flesh may die, and that which is born of the spirit will live forever. 
May God give us the faith to believe what God has promised us in his word, that we may be complete in him. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your truth. I pray all those under the sound of my voice would have a relationship with you, O Father, through the, through the sacrifice, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the cross. Pray that we continue to live in the power of that. And God, I pray that you would increase our faith as we journey along with you. Grow our faith as we journey along with you. Lord, so that we would not only be full of confidence about what you have for our eternity, but so that we would be a, an able and capable witness with thy help, with thy power, an able and capable witness of this gospel truth to a lost and dying world. God, work in my heart, I pray. May we allow you to do your completing work as we further understand your death, burial, and resurrection. Give us faith. Understand it and all the implications in our life. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We'll sing here in just a moment, 457. More and more about Jesus. That's the opportunity of this life as we grow in him. I have that correct, right? As they begin to play that hymn of invitation... May we come closer to the Lord and all that he has for us. Do you know Christ is your Savior? If you're struggling with your faith, remember faith comes from God. No wonder you're struggling because you're trying to work it up. You're trying to scrape it together. Excuse me. You're trying to strengthen yourself. and You vacillate. I think we all know what that's like. Put faith in the completed work of Christ, the effective, completed operation of Christ and God's work that he did through him on the cross. May we have more of Jesus, believers, more of Jesus so that we can be complete in him. Let's stand together, if you would, please. We'll sing a verse, a chorus of this. As God works, as God works, this altar is open. There's room on this front pew here if you're not able to kneel. If you'd like someone to pray with you, we stand ready to help you. Allow God to be your completion. Seek the Lord for his understanding. As we sing together, 457. More about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. Sing that last verse, Brother Caleb, if you don't mind, please. More about Jesus on his throne, riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace. so much. If you'll lift your head and look right this way, I appreciate you being in the Lord's house today.